Jelly Belly, let me know if you agree with me when I say that nobody else makes a better jelly bean. I will talk more about what makes them so special and sets them apart from the others, but as far as I'm concerned, they are in a league of their own. I find that to be particularly impressive, considering that at this point, most of the popular candy brands are owned by a much larger publicly traded candy company. Reese's is made by Hershey's, Snickers is made by Mars, and that sort of thing, but Jelly Belly has always been on its own as a privately owned family company. Just think about this they were able to take a somewhat unpopular, mostly overlooked candy and through innovation, marketing, determination, used it to build an internationally recognized multi-million dollar business. All of us know Jelly Belly for their jelly beans. They make over a million of them an hour, meaning billions of them are consumed each year. So obviously, that's where they've been successful, that's where the majority of their sales come from, but this company was not originally called Jelly Belly, and in fact, has roots going back to almost a century before they even sold a single jelly bean. For most of that time, they were primarily focused on selling candy corn, which I realize doesn't seem like the most dramatic transition from candy corn to jelly beans, but in this video, I will show you how significant it truly was for them. Going all the way back to the 1860s, two brothers with the last name of Golitz immigrated from Germany to the United States. One of them bought a candy shop in Illinois, his brother became involved, eventually they both had sons that would go on to work there, and it became a successful little candy business that would deliver their products around the area in horse-drawn carriages. Then, in the 1890s, there was an economic depression labeled the Panic of 1893. With a name like that, you know things were bad. The Golitz family felt the effects of it. They had trouble maintaining the business, and unfortunately, they had to sell it. But shortly after the depression ended, there was a new opportunity in the market, and that motivated one of the sons to start his own candy business. He was soon joined by the other members of the Golitz family, and in a way, I guess it kind of restarted the family business. But this time, their new focus was on a category called mellow creams, or butter creams, specifically candy corn. At that time, it was still a relatively new candy, having been invented the previous decade without a tremendous amount of popularity just yet. In fact, the Golitz family played a big part in popularizing it. See, at the turn of the century, regular corn, the grain itself, wasn't even all that popular with people. It was mostly considered to be food for farm animals, so the Golitz family took advantage of the novelty there by promoting their candy corn as chicken feed. The three colors together in the candy corn made it difficult to manufacture given the technology available at the time, so most companies didn't really want to do it. It was a lot of work and hard to be profitable with it, so the Golitz family was able to outlast every one of their competitors, meaning today they are recognized as the oldest existing candy corn maker. Even today, after so many changes, the Jelly Belly Company does make it. They have been doing it non-stop for 120 25 years now, and nobody else can say that. In the early 1900s, one of the family members, Herman, left the family company to start his own similar company across the country in the San Francisco area. So then, it was somewhat of a confusing situation, where the newly formed Herman Golitz Candy Company was around San Francisco selling candy corn, and the original Golitz Confectionery Company was around Chicago also selling candy corn. It does seem like that would be an issue, but these were local companies in a time well before the internet, so there were very few people ever encountering both of them. That's how they existed for multiple decades, but in the 1960s, things really started to get difficult. See, candy corn had been gaining momentum. It was now being associated with Halloween, causing spikes in demand in autumn. Other companies saw it as an opportunity, so they started making it, and all of a sudden, the market for candy corn was more competitive than ever before. Golitz was still a relatively small operation. They didn't even own a forklift, so they found it difficult to remain competitive. So their new plan was to introduce different products with higher profit margins so they could hopefully make some money without having to make so much candy. One of these new products, the most notable one, was Golitz Mini Jelly Beans. The big selling point for them was the stronger taste. See, most other jelly beans would only have flavoring in the outer shell, whereas these had it all infused within the center. As far as I could tell, it was a successful product, but it wasn't nearly enough to transform them into a multi-million 
billion dollar sensation, and in fact, it wasn't really enough to even stabilize the company. In 1975, the price of sugar suddenly skyrocketed. I'm talking about 75 cents a pound, four times pricier than just a few years earlier, which is not good for a candy company. They literally had to take out loans so they could buy sugar so they can continue making their products and remain open. Money was so tight that they had a hard time paying their employees and things were looking doubtful. That is where David Klein, maybe heroically, enters the story. There is quite a bit of controversy here. The extent of his contribution has been debated, to a point where there is even a lawsuit happening between Jelly Belly and himself. Logically, the details are a little sketchy, but it does seem like he was able to set the company on a much better course, and it would likely not be as big today without him. David Klein was working for a nut distributor when he had an idea that basically there should be a really high quality jelly bean. At that point, jelly beans were usually seen as a cheap Easter candy. Like I said before, mostly unpopular and overlooked, maybe you can even say disrespected. But David Klein felt that if someone could make a premium version with high quality, more natural ingredients, that it would be such a step up that people would be willing to pay the higher price. So he went out and told Golitz about his idea and they agreed to come up with a recipe and make the beans for him. David Klein came up with the brand name Jelly Belly and rented out a portion of an ice cream shop to sell them to the public. Initially sales were slow, but he had this plan where he convinced a reporter to come down to the shop where he had gotten a bunch of people that he already knew to form a big line, making it look like everyone wanted to buy his jelly beans. It somehow worked. It made the people who saw that actually want to buy the jelly beans and they gained a lot of momentum from there. I would describe David Klein as an eccentric person with a big personality. So throughout the rest of the 1970s, he became somewhat of a mascot for the brand, actually calling himself Mr. Jelly Belly. He appeared on television programs, People Magazine even published a wild photo of him in a bathtub full of jelly beans. It was a relationship where the Golitz family was in charge of the recipes and production, while David Klein was in charge of the ideas and promotion. But by 1980, it appears that Jelly Belly no longer wanted to work with him, potentially because they felt his antics were harmful to the perception of the brand, or possibly because of his unreliability. Either way, they offered he and his business partner $5 million for the full rights to the trademark, David accepted, has not had any association with the company ever since, and that turned out to be a terrible decision, mostly because of President Ronald Reagan. You may not have seen that one coming, but Ronald Reagan was a huge fan of the Golitz Jelly Beans. Even before David Klein and the Jelly Belly name, when they were still the lower quality ones called Golitz Mini Jelly Beans, Ronald Reagan was eating them. In 1966, when he was running for governor of California, he discovered the Golitz Jelly Beans and began eating them while he was trying to quit smoking. Once the company learned about that, they started sending him a bunch of jelly beans all the time. In 1973, while he was serving as governor, he wrote a letter to the company that said, we can hardly start a meeting or make a decision without passing the jar of jelly beans. And then once the higher quality Jelly Belly brand was introduced, they started sending him those instead. You may already see where this is heading, but in January of 1981, less than a year after David Klein accepted the deal to sell the trademark, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as president. That was maybe the biggest thing that could have ever happened to Jelly Belly. As you may have guessed, having the president of the United States playfully associated with your brand tends to be good for business. They even developed a blueberry flavor so they could pair it with very cherry and coconut to send 3.5 tons of red, white, and blue jelly beans to Washington, D.C. for the ceremonies. In that one year, sales doubled to $16 million, and they kept reinvesting most of their profits right back into the business. In 1983, Reagan famously sent some jelly beans as a gift to Sally Ride and the other members of the Challenger space shuttle mission, making them the first official jelly beans in space. By the 1990s, the two separate companies in California and Illinois were yet again working together to fill the $100 million worth of jelly beans that people were demanding from them. In 2001, the two of them finally merged together under the Jelly Belly name. It just made sense at that point, and that is how they still exist today. I also have to mention that a big part of the Jelly Belly appeal has been the unique flavors. And look, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but a lot of these jelly beans have flavors that are more accurate than I would have ever thought possible. Jelly Bellies were originally available in eight flavors. Very cherry, tangerine, lemon, green apple, grape jelly, licorice, that was Reagan's favorite and my least favorite, by the way, and notably root beer and cream soda. Already unconventional right from the beginning, and I believe we have David Klein to thank for that. But unlike most others, he didn't 
think that they should be mixed together. Each flavor was packaged in its own bag. All unique marketing decisions to separate themselves. Within a year, there were already 25 flavors, and today, there are well over 100. In 1989, they introduced buttered popcorn as their first savory flavor that actually dethroned Very Cherry as their most popular flavor for a five-year period starting in 1998, and even today, it remains among the top. In 1993, they put out the sour ones. In 2000, they made Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Jelly Beans based on the ones from Harry Potter, obviously with ridiculous flavors like soap and black pepper that are somehow still suspiciously accurate. In 2005, they came out with Sports Beans for athletes. In 2008, the game Bean Boozled came out with even wilder flavors, in my opinion. All very fun and creative, and in addition to all of that, they have made numerous licensing deals. You can find Jelly Bellies made with flavors from Krispy Kreme, Dr. Pepper, Cold Stone Creamery, Tabasco, all subjects of previous videos, by the way. So, there you have it. Again, shifting from candy corn to jelly beans may not seem like the biggest change, but Jelly Belly will probably say otherwise. The determination of the Golitz family, the ideas of David Klein, and the approval of Ronald Reagan all combine to make their transition into jelly beans one of the most successful business stories in history. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about Jelly Belly? Are they in fact tastier and more creative than the alternatives, to a point where they deserve to be as successful as they are, or maybe you think that they are overrated. Also, I'm so curious to ask, what is your favorite flavor? Is it one of the basic ones, or maybe it's something unique that most people haven't even given much attention? I have thought long and hard about this question, and I would have to say pancakes and maple syrup is the winner in my eyes. I challenge you to go out and try that, come back and tell me what you think about it. I do not think that you will be disappointed. And any other thoughts you have about Jelly Bell, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Happy Easter to those who celebrate it, and thank you for watching.